Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. I don't know very many really, really good elder law attorneys. And people always say, that's because all you've ever done is anything with Joe Carp. I said, well, I always go for the best. So, good morning, Joe Carp. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm doing great. And, and you know, I, I, you will be thrilled because the November issue is going to have on the cover, of course, um, the picture of what that gorgeous parrot that, that you and Debbie went on this wonderful trip to Brazil. And the blue I... Macaw. What? The blue macaw. Yeah, I put that on the front cover. It's gorgeous. And then... Of course, the gorgeous story that she wrote. And I am so pleased that you are taking the time to go off into the into the wildest places in the world. I will follow, follow my wife anywhere. My wife was <laughs> raised in the Bronx by the Bronx Zoo. She has always loved animals, but always felt bad about their captivity. Oh, is that why? During, during our years of raising children, we never did anything that wasn't children related, and which meant to either you know go to Washington D.C. or something like that if we took a trip, and just made sure that we did the children related stuff, or, or Disney or whatever. Uh, but now, and, and we took them other places we thought they'd find interesting. But now my wife wants to see some of the world of nature and. Uh, my attitude, as many of your listeners well know, you can only do it when you can, so do it while you can, because the body, our own human bodies, as well as the safety of the world keeps changing, and the ability to travel keeps changing, so she wanted to go to Brazil, to the Pantanal, which is the largest wetlands in the world, and see beautiful nature, and uh, we did that. It was terrific. Yeah, I I could see that, and I am so happy about that. Well, I was we reading. We had to. Tra- we could travel really light. I mean, if you had, if you had the, any pants that ever belonged in a dry cleaner, you shouldn't have worn them there, or shoes that should be shined, you don't wear them there. It was <laughs> right. a, totally delightful from that level too. We could travel really light. Didn't need anything that was the pretext of being travelers in the uh, traditional sense. Yeah. No midnight, mid, no midnight buffets. No midnight buffet, um, buffets. But I was reading your article, this particular one that's going to be coming up in November. How will probate impact your family? I think it was good that you went back and started talking about probate because years ago when, when you first started writing and when I first knew you, it's a big subject. Probate, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? And, and now it's passed. Everything seems to be into uh, trusts and you know, irrevocable and revocable and, and you know now with the veterans. But going back to the basics and probate, I think it was a very good article. Yeah, I think it's just a reminder that people sort of forget what probate is and some people forget why we have it legally, and very simply, it's a way to pass assets from a decedent to a beneficiary if there's not an automatic go. And by that I mean an automatic go is a beneficiary designated account. It's a joint with right of survivorship account, or it's an asset in the trust because it's not automatic, but it doesn't have to go through probate. People are under a couple of general misconceptions. One, that the size of your estate determines whether you'll have probate. And that's not true. The size of your estate will determine whether you have estate taxes. Unfortunately, for most of our listeners, they don't have estate taxes. And we say, well, why is that unfortunate? It means for a single individual, they have less than $5.4 million, and for a married couple, they have less than 10.8. So if you're a married couple and don't have $10.8 million, that's unfortunate, and I say that with a degree of sarcasm, you won't have estate taxes. If you have $15 million, you face estate taxes. We should all have such problems. Right. But people always, right? 
So people always just assume that the size of the estate controls whether there's probate, and that's not true. The size of the estate only is relevant to estate tax. The other thing is that people assume if they have a will, they avoid probate, and that's not true as well. There are two ways to go through probate, with a will and without a will. If you have a will, and assume it's valid, etc., etc., that's still, if an asset is passing under it, if you died and you have a house, a bank account, and a brokerage account, all in your own name, without a co-owner, without a beneficiary, and even if the value of the whole thing is $150,000, it's going to go through probate, even if you have a will. If you say, when I die, everything goes to my three children equally, then those assets will go through probate. And what the will accomplishes is it sets forth who you want to be in charge and how you want to pass those assets. If you didn't have a will, those same assets would go through probate, but the legislature has determined your beneficiaries by rules the legislature has passed and laws they've passed And the judge gets to decide who will administer your estate. Uh, Usually they'll listen to the heir's recommendation and selection, but the judge gets to decide that it wasn't somebody you selected. But the same two estates go through probate. It's just, how do they get there? So a will or no will, you can have probate. And the other thing people have to understand, just as an aside, is if your will says, I leave everything in service to my three kids, but you've made your eldest child the beneficiary of all your accounts, she's getting it, and that asset is not going through probate, and that asset will pass to that child, and it's only the remaining assets that will be divided in thirds. But probate is a reality, and it's time-consuming. There are some states that are very user-friendly for probate. New Jersey is the easiest state for probate in the nation. Of course, it's very rough to cross the George Washington Bridge if you piss off Governor Christie, but it's a very easy, but it's a very easy state oh, for probate. They have a very user-friendly system and a very non-complicated system. Florida has a very painstakingly slow system, and one of the reasons, and people may wonder why, the Florida legislature, and I'm not saying right or wrong, but this is what they have determined. They said that probate's a way to pass assets to your beneficiaries and go through your system, so you think, well, that should be a pretty simple thing. File the will and give me the money, you know. But Florida's probate system is designed... But that's the secondary portion of it. The primary function, if you listen to people who are truly in the probate business, is to protect creditors, to make sure they get paid off before the money disappears. Hmm. So that you have to do a publication to creditors, known and unknown. You have to serve notice on known creditors. You have the duty to check who may be a known creditor. And there have been cases where, by example, when the person died and there was a publication, which gives about 90 days for people randomly to answer, but there's a two-year period for creditors to file a claim. Now, that publication speeds up the meter to those 90 days or so, so that the creditor time has lapsed, except if it's a creditor who's known or should be known, they still have the full two years if you didn't notice them. And you'd say, well, well, we get bills in the mail, so we pay those off. Well, who should be known? Well, there was a case a couple of years ago where the creditor who the publication took place, nobody responded, 
the known creditors were taken care of, and they paid everybody off, and then a year later, but within the two years, a creditor came out and said, wait a minute, I was being paid every month by check by this person, and they were supposed to send me money, and there was a promissory note. Mm. And the court held that the personal representative had a duty to check the check register to see if there was regular payments being made, because if they had done that and they had seen $150.32 was paid to this entity every month for the past year, well, that sort of sounds like a bill, doesn't it? Sounds like there might have been a creditor. And we said, that's a creditor that you should have done due diligence and you should have determined. And that creditor could come back and bite the person in the backside. So anyway, probate is about creditor protection as much as it is about beneficiary protection. Well, let's go to wills now. Okay, so let's say let's just give an example of someone dying without a will. And then let's give an example of someone dying without a trust and then someone dying with a trust. Maybe three different examples of one particular family. Well, they didn't, okay. Well, if they died without a will, the legislature has, and, and we're assuming the assets are just in that person's name. Right, right. Okay. And let's just say the person had, it was a single person, we will a single person, a widow or a widow or a single all their life, but we'll make it a single person with a couple of kids. If that single person with a couple of kids dies without a will, right now under Florida law, the beneficiaries are that we would still have to go through probate. The beneficiaries in that we're assuming the state's more than seventy five thousand dollars because there's simpler rules for smaller than seventy five thousand. The, the children would have to decide who they want to ask the court to appoint as a personal representative, and the children are the beneficiaries. And pleadings would have to be filed in court, basically saying the person died it without a will. Here's who the children are. Here's who they they are the only children, and there were no other children, and it's to go to those children equally, and that starts the process. Then the court has to appoint the one of, we're assuming that the children are qualified, and the court will allow them to select one of them to be in charge. Then they have to publish a notice to creditors. They have to then use the court orders to marshal the assets. They have to count back to the court with every step of what they have done, what the inventory of the assets was, what they did with that money, that all of the creditors who had a right to file a claim have had that time, and if either had none or whatever claims were filed were satisfied, or why aren't they being, and bring it back into court. And then ultimately, after you go through that process, and although I'm giving you a Reader's Digest version, that can take you a year. If we get a little more complicated in the fact Suppose there were three children and one of them was deceased. And let's assume that deceased child had two children, one of whom was estranged from the family and a drug addict, and the other one was okay. Then the law says the deceased child's children get that child's share. That's automatic in our intestate law. So they then have to in finding the heirs and taking care of it, they'd have to give a third to the two living children, a sixth to the, the child who was wholesome. They'd have to find the drug-addicted child, which the grandparent would have probably cut out or at least put the money in some sort of fashion that they wouldn't have had ready access to use this money just to kill themselves and do harm to themselves with drugs. And that child would have to be found, and that child would have to be given their one-six. And that, of course, gets more tedious, sometimes more expensive when you're hunting for that child. So that can be a very arduous and even more painstaking procedure. And 
typically inconsistent with the desire of the decedent. Because we'll assume, even though you may love your grandchild who has a drug addict, a drug problem, you don't love what they do and you certainly wouldn't want to give them a blank check to harm themselves. So there's the law says this is who gets it. So you're, you're stuck with the law as it is. So that's one scenario. If there's a will, it's going to go, if there's, now the next one you want to know is if there is a will. Yes. It's the same set of procedures, except who you say you want to get it, and who you say is going to be in charge will be, so long as they're qualified. And under Florida, we have certain laws as to who can serve as the person in charge of your probate of your will, and that would be, and we call that the personal representative, not an executor or executrix. We have a uh, gender-neutral term in Florida and have for many, many years. Uh, the personal representative, if you selected them, and they are either a blood relative or a Floridian, they can serve. So if your lawyer in New Jersey was named the personal representative under your will, they would mix it. But if it's your cousin... In Sheboygan, because the New Jersey lawyer is not a relative or a Floridian, but if your sister in Pennsylvania or a cousin in Sheboygan or your son in Bangladesh is named, since they are your blood relatives, they can serve. Or your next-door neighbor and best friend, Shirley, who lives in Boca Raton, could also serve because she's a Floridian, even though she's not a relative. But if your best friend, Shirley, is only here four months of the year and lives in New Jersey eight months, she's not a Floridian, so she could... But anyway, that's who serves. And your will would say, who gets what? The person in charge would then do the same thing, do a publication to notice the creditors. They would then search for the known creditors by checking the mail, checking the bills, checking the check register. One of the things, and I think we're the only law firm I've ever heard of that does it because... The personal representative, when they give away all the money and close the estate, is liable to those creditors if they didn't do due diligence. So one of the things our firm has done that took us over a year to get the right to do it is on every estate, uh, we do a credit check. We do, through one of the three credit checking agencies, we put, submit the decedent's name and information to see if there are any outstanding creditors. And you'd be surprised what we find. Oh, what we find the most of? What? What we find, because the kids always say, my mother paid all of her bills. You know, my parents never did anything with liability. What we find is sometimes grandparents have co-signed car loans or student loans. And if their granddaughter defaults on that student loan, they they are a creditor as a guarantor. Mm -hmm. So we take care of those and send them a notice. So they can bark if they want to bank bark in order to take care of them and eliminate them as creditors. So we, we do that. And we're the only ones I know of. In fact, I, I was surprised. It, just, it, it was after that check register case. I said, we have to do more than we're doing because half the times people today don't have check registers. Everything's on the damn computer. Oh, that's true. I hate that. The payment yeah. was too. And what are you supposed to do? Check each statement, and it says one hundred and fifty dollars and seventy-two cents every month, and then figure out backwards who it was. I said, let's get real. People aren't going to do this. We better double check. We better at least have an argument that we did due diligence. So we've been doing that. And then they check for the creditors, and then when they marshal the assets, they pay the bills, make sure everything's taken care of. And remember, there are some things you don't even think of that may be bills. Like what? Well, if somebody dies today, there there very well may be a 2015 income tax return due for that person next year. That's got to be resolved. Those are debts. Those are obligations. And then once they marshal all the resources... Then, and they've taken care of the creditors, and they follow the terms of the will in order to distribute everything, get receipts from everybody, and then supply those receipts to the court, showing that the beneficiaries got paid. And then, 
the court will finally close the estate and let the person off the hook. Mm. Even the personal representative puts you on the hook. We have uh, uh, told clients on, uh, and many of them get, I uh, think we're, we're a little too fastidious, but people are sometimes not very considerate. So we say, when you're sending out that final check, I wouldn't just send that receipt say, here's the money. I would say, here's a copy of the check. We're holding it in our law firm trust account. When you sign this receipt and return it to us, then we will give you the money. And if you don't like that deal, you can come to our office and we'll do an exchange. But I'm not sending you a check unless I know I've got a receipt because otherwise I'm going to have to deal with the court and they won't let me close the estate and they won't let me go take care of release the personal representative from their obligation. And the person says, oh, but that's my nephew. Come on, my nephew and niece, they'll do it. And then the, when I and if the client says do it, even though we've admonished them, we got to do what the client says. And then all of a sudden they'll call, we'll say, we still haven't, we sent the check, it's cleared but your nephew still hasn't sent the receipt. And they call and they complain, and the nephew is either bad with paper, loses things inconsiderate, or pissed off that he only got 15% instead of 20%, like his sister, and now he's acting out. So we're always big on, you got to get all these things done. Now, if there had been a trust, so that's probate, you can't get off the hook until the court discharges you, so you can linger. And that takes time, and that's a lot of paperwork back and forth and accountability to the court. Now, that is a protection. You know, you do have an overseer. The court's checking that everything is being done according to your desires. Then there's the trust. If your assets have been titled in the trust, the trustee has no accountability to the court. They have accountability to the beneficiaries. They have the same duties technically, without the formality. So they have to find the creditors and pay off the bills, and they just don't have to be constantly accounting to the court, and they don't have the same deadlines that the court imposes. And if the trustee doesn't get a receipt, doesn't matter, there's no estate to close, and the trustee says, well, I don't care, I have have the canceled check, I'm good to go, I don't care. It would have been nice if my nephew signed it, and the trustee also doesn't have the same restrictions as to who can serve. It can be anybody. So it can be your best friend, Shirley, who lives in New Jersey, or it can be your former accountant or attorney in New Jersey, or it can be your brother-in-law in Wisconsin. So it broadens the scope of things. The other thing is obviously the will is a very public instrument, and the trust is a very private instrument. The will gets filed on public record. Before you go into that way, I have a question. So, like in the movies, when someone dies, you go to a lawyer's office and the will is read. Is that still done? No, and there's a reason for that. Photocopy machines. <laughs> they used to read the will because nobody had copies. Mm-hmm. So in the old days, they couldn't send the will out to circulate for everybody to read. Right? Mm-hmm. So they said, we're going to read the will. But today, we just send everybody a copy, and it's filed on public record. They can request it from the clerk to the court and get a copy. So photocopies has eliminated the need for the reading of a will, because everybody can read it themselves. Make sense? Yep. Yep, yep. I was listening. That's, that was always something I worried about. And one more question. Why isn't there a class in high school? Uh, I don't know what it would be under, uh, but why is there a class about this so that the kids understand just, you know, just a very brief uh, rundown of what the differences are that you've described? Don't you think that'd be well, smart? I, I, the, the answer is, uh, I guess with high school, there's enough other fundamental things they have to learn about life itself. I mean, we're dropping music and art from high school and that. That's probably more important than having kids learn that. But there should be some, and, and what my workshops are, if you want to talk about them, yeah, are let's continuing do that. education, if you will, for adults to learn about this, because 
I understand why an 18 year old may not get it. Okay. The thing that baffles me is why 48 year olds aren't getting it when they have 78 year old parents and why their 78 year old parents don't get it. And they're the people who are in need to know. I mean, it's the more information that people have is always better. I mean, Everybody should learn half the things Dr. Mencia is talking about as well. But our school system has limitations for high school students. So okay, so I'm going to do about, I'm going to do your they senior survival about a contract, right? Maybe. <laughs> right. Let, let me do your senior survival workshops. I, I want everyone get your pencils out. This is Pencil Talk Radio. This is the best buy in South Florida. You have to go do this. First of all, you'll meet. Joe Carp, who really should be, um, he's an entertainer, even though he says he's an elder law attorney, but I think he's an entertainer first. Secondly, Tuesday. I have a straw hat and a candle. I know. When I do the I know you and by do. the way, just so your listeners know, on the workshops this month, Jenny Bernstein will be doing both Boynton Beach and Port St. Lucie, and I will be doing just Palm Beach Gardens because I'm going up on the trustee for a client who's passed away, their husband and wife who passed away, whose daughter is a 58-year-old schizophrenic, and I have to go up to Baltimore to attend to her affairs, so I will be gone Thursday. Let's continue. So Jenny will do it. She's also board certified. Okay, so Joe, I only have in front of me the December the December I ones. Have the, I have the November. Why don't we you do November? We are prepared. So okay. I'm going to give people the workshop schedule. On Tuesday, November 10, we start at 1.30 promptly in Port St. Lucie at the Holiday Inn. We will be doing our senior survival workshop where we will be talking about living trust. We will explain probate. We will talk about Medicaid, long-term care, and veterans benefits and how people can qualify and what they can do. We'll talk about the changes in the law. Wait, wait, wait. So we'll we better you... give the other times because we are going to run out okay. of time, Joe. Wednesday in Palm Beach Gardens at the Marriott Hotel at RCA Boulevard or PGA Boulevard at 130 in Palm Beach Gardens. And Boynton Beach on Thursday at the Courtyard Marriott. Our toll-free number, and those are all 130, is 1-800-893-9911. And the website is carplaw, K-A-R-P-L-A-W, Dot com. On and, there, you can see the schedule and get all sorts of other loaded information. And I have to say goodbye, and thank you so much, Joe. Great show. Thank you. See you in December. Yes. Bye. Bye.